You're listening to a message presented at New Market Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in New Market, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at New Market Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. I wanted to take just a minute to step in line with some other preachers across the United States. You all know Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son? Franklin Graham, along with about 250 other pastors, have sent out notes and letters, and they've asked us to take a few moments in our service to stop and to pray for our country. Uh, they believe, and I am right there with them, that our country is on a precipice. And either we're going to get things back in order or we are headed down a slope that's going to take us someplace where we don't want to go. So what we're asking that the churches across America pray today is that God will give wisdom to people in leadership. And that rather than trying to line their pockets and uh, be politically correct, they would begin to care about the American people and become morally correct. So if you would bow with me, let's just take a moment to ask God's blessing on this great nation. Dear God, as I stand here in front of this group of people, I know that Franklin Graham and those who stand with him are right. We are in a difficult place as a nation. We want to be loving and yet we want to be wise. Dear Lord, we know that there is a difference between religious beliefs and political systems. We know that we live in a country where morals seem to be thrown to the side and everyone's concerned about doing what's politically correct in order that they can get the kudos that they want to receive from the special interest groups and line their pockets. Let this end, dear Lord, in order that those who lead our country might truly be the servants that they're supposed to be representing the people rather than ruling over them. Help us as a nation, dear Lord, to be the kind of people that constantly live in a moral way that lets folks know this is a Christian country that seeks to serve you. It's a difficult time, and we're scared. Be with our president and our leaders and give them the wisdom that they need, dear Lord, to represent us wisely. And in the process, we ask that you will be lifted up in this country. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. With that prayer, I tell you what, that's a mouthful. We want this country to head in the right direction, but ultimately, we want to be headed in the right direction spiritually. I don't know about you, but I would really like to go to heaven someday. I, I think it sounds like a pretty cool place. Uh, in this morning's sermon title is God Invites Us to Our forever home, if you will. The lesson has a ton of scripture inside of it. It's on the screen behind me. If you look inside your bulletin, you'll find it there. You'll probably want to take those home and read them so that you can make sure that I'm teaching truth. Uh, that's one thing, we put them in there so you can look them up and make sure that everything is based on the scriptures that we say it's based on. So take them home, look them up. Um, what I want you to know is that God has some awesome promises for those who possess an obedient faith in him. And one of my favorites is found in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. You've heard me quote that one again and again because I just love it. This translation is a little different than one that I normally quote, but I wanted to share it because it's what's used in the Vacation Bible School material. It says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so... What I have not told you, what I put that I'm going there to prepare a place for you, if I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. I think that's a wonderful promise. You know what Jesus is saying is, I'm getting my house ready for you to come visit. Who doggies? I don't know what happens at your house when people come visit. My wife made me clean toilets. 
She says, I'll do all this if you just clean that. I think, well, that, you know, that's, that's the way life goes. I don't know exactly what Jesus is doing, but I have a feeling it's going to be pretty sparkly when we get there. He's getting everything all ready for us to come live with him, not just for a little while, but to live with him for all eternity. When I hear these words of Jesus, I am overjoyed to know that what he's doing is he's inviting me to my forever home with him. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It is so neat to think about living in heaven with Jesus forever and forever. Now we hear that, and hindsight's 2020. But the disciples, when they heard these words of Jesus, they didn't quite get it. They were a little confused by the whole thing. Jesus said, now come on guys. You ought to know beyond a shadow of a doubt where I'm going. And you ought to know how to get there. Now, they didn't get it. They're standing there scratching their proverbial heads. Couldn't figure out what in the world was going on. And finally, this guy by the name of Thomas speaks up. Gets enough courage to say, you know what, Jesus? We don't have the foggiest idea what you're talking about. We don't know where you're going, and we sure don't know how to get there. I think you need to explain this to us. You know, don't you wish a lot of people would just speak up and say, I don't get it? Well, Thomas spoke up. He said, we don't get it, and Jesus began to explain it. He answered this question for Thomas, and in the answer, we are given a wonderful snapshot of what it takes to go from life to life eternal. And I love Jesus' response because he just lays it out there. Jesus told them, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. You want to go to my house? You got to come through me. Now let me make this clear to you. Let me explain to you what this means. And it is not politically correct. So if you want politically correct, you better get ready to put in your chewing teeth because this ain't going to go down so easy. Here's the thing. Buddha can't save you. Can't do it. Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Buddha can't save you. Now this is really politically incorrect in the day in which we live. Muhammad can't save you. Can't do it. Now, this one's going to step on our toes. Good works can't save you. You can't work your way to heaven. Doesn't work that way. Now, if you're real rich, this might hurt your feelings. Your money can't save you. You can't buy your way in. I mean, take all the gold you want. They say, so what? The streets are paid with that stuff. You can't buy your way into heaven. For all you pretty people... Your cute smile ain't going to get you into heaven either. <laughs> it don't work that way. Jesus made it clear. He says, if you want to spend eternity in my Father's house, you've got to come through me. You've got to get there through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. You talk about politically incorrect in the world in which we are living today. That is politically incorrect. No one wants to hear the only way to heaven is through Jesus. They're wanting us to say, oh, just believe whatever you want to, follow whatever religion you want to, it'll all be okay because we're all going to the same place and praying to the same God, and I say, baloney. That's not what Jesus said. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. I guarantee you none of us want to miss out on the chance to go to heaven. We just don't want to because heaven is described as a wonderful place. The picture of words that he gives to us when he tries to explain what heaven is like, it is so cool. He says, I'm going to make all things new. This whole world is going to melt with fervent heat. I've only done this once in my life. I bought one brand new car. They smell different than those other cars. They do. I, I like it. You get in there and you think to yourself, I wish, I wish my car smelled like that. They even got dog in the back seat and somebody's been smoking on that side and I don't know what all they had in that car before I get it. I know one car, we got a flood in it, it smelled like fish. <laughs> but that new car, man, that thing smells good. Or you walk into a brand new house 
And, and you, you smell, I think it's the formaldehyde, really, but don't tell anybody it was like. But, but you know that smell that a brand new house has got? Jesus says, when he comes again, this is all going to be brand new heaven and earth. That old stuff's going to melt with fervent heat, and I'm going to make something even better. And this new city, four square, it describes it, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It's going to come down in order that God can dwell right here with us and we can dwell right there with Him and it describes city gates and it describes all kinds of stuff. Here's the bottom line. This old world that we know, it, this dirt in the bucket ain't going to matter no more. Your house that you're working so hard on, whew, man, I can tell you that this week. It ain't going to be there no more. It's all going to be gone. It, your, that fancy car you've been paying payments on for like the last five years, it's gone. By then it's worn out anyway. you got to start over. Uh, the bottom line is all this stuff is just going to be gone. Melt with fervent heat. That means it's really, really hot. It's just going to melt away. And then poof, Jesus is going to make it all anew. The good news, we're going to get a brand new place to live. And it's going to be so much better than this place. There isn't even going to be a comparison. And I can't even pretend that my pea brain can wrap itself around what heaven is going to be like. He tries to describe it for us with saying this new city for a square is going to come down. It's going to be something beautiful. He makes that very clear. God's dwelling place is going to be amazing. I hope you've got that. His dwelling place is going to be amazing and we're going to get to live there with him. We're going to be his people and he's going to be our God and we're going to move into his place and there's not going to be any more crying. I was writing a sermon a week or so ago and my wife came home and I've been crying all afternoon. Really hadn't cried up until that point and it had been a, some years but I was writing a Father's Day sermon and I've got it written and I don't know if I can preach it because <laughs> I sat there and cried like a baby as I thought about the fact that my dad was gone and in his lifetime I was never going to see him again. There's not going to be any more crying. There's not going to be any more pain. There's not going to be any more death, and I'm thankful for that. There's not going to be any more mourning like I was mourning for my father. All that old yucky stuff is going to be gone. And he says, there's going to be this beautiful river flowing from the throne of God right down through the middle of the street of that great city. And the water of life is going to flow down through there, crystal clear, cool, refreshing, right out of the throne of God. You know, there's just enough hillbilly in me to wonder something. I wonder if there's any fish in fishing poles. <laughs> and that's just the hillbilly side of me, can't help myself. For the first time since the Garden of Eden, when God put the flaming sword in the hand of the angel, to keep mankind away from the tree of life. For the first time since then, that tree appears again. It says it's growing there on either side of that river and that it's going to be producing fruit in each month of the year and that its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Don't ask me, I don't understand. If there's not going to be more sickness, what are we going to need healing for? I don't have the answers. I can just tell you what it says there. Uh, I'll, I'll probably know when I get there because God will make it all clear to me. There's some things about as clear as mud right now whenever I try to wrap my mind around it all. What I do know is it sounds like a neat place to live for all eternity. The curse of sin will be gone for good. And Jesus will be seated on his throne in full view of us all. We will see him face to face and we will wear his name for all eternity. There'll be no more darkness. Jesus himself will be the light of heaven. Remember his words, he says, in him is the life, and the life is the light of men. What that means is, he's our light now, and he will be our light for all eternity. That's the picture that's being painted. There in the midst of all this glory, we're going to live with God forever and ever. But this will only happen if we give our lives to Jesus. You can't buy your way in. You can't smile your way in. You're going to have to come through Jesus. There's no other way to enter the city of God. If we choose to reject Jesus, 
that it's not going to be nearly so nice for us. I know it's not politically correct to talk about this stuff, but too bad. Those who reject Jesus are going to end up in a place of eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It says that that place is going to be filled with cowardly people, with unbelieving people, with vile people, with murderers, with sexually immoral people, with those who practice the magic arts, the idolaters, the liars. That place is described as a fiery lake of burning sulfur where the condemned will face the second death for all eternity. They'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of God forever and ever. That means while we are enjoying being face to face with Jesus, they're going to be completely separated from Him. You see, God's going to put those people in that place, not because He wants them to suffer, but because they chose to go there. And it's not going to be a fun place. They have chosen to go to a place that's filled with weeping and gnashing of teeth. It says the fire is never going to go out. And you think that's creepy? It says there's going to be worms there chewing and gnawing on you. And it says that the condemned are going to be facing those worms and those worms you can't kill them because they'll never die. I don't mind fishing worms, but I don't want the worms to bite back. Especially not for all eternity. And you smash the little sucker and he comes right back and on again. There's something not right about that picture. I don't want to go there. Those vile worms never die. It's your choice though. God wants us to come live with him. But he won't force us to go there against our will. It's like this. God cast a vote for you. He says, I want you to come live with me forever in heaven. It's a beautiful place. The devil cast a vote for you. And he says... Come on down here and enjoy these worms with me. But you cast the deciding vote as far as where you're going to spend eternity. It's pretty simple. If you choose to live with God forever, you get to go be with Him. If you love Jesus, you get to go be with Him. If you live like the devil, that's where you're going to be for all eternity is with Him. Each of us are given the opportunity to cast our vote. And we'll cast that vote by either accepting God's love gift or by rejecting God's love gift. God's love gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You make a choice. How will you respond to God's invitation to join him in his forever home? How will you respond to God's invitation to join him Here's the thing. Your response only makes a difference because Jesus gave that love gift for you. He spread his arms and died. He rose to life in order that we could have the promise that if we choose to accept that love gift, we can live with him forever. And it's only effective because he lives. If he had died and never rose from the dead, this would all be ridiculous. But that's not the case. Jesus rose and he blazed the trail for us. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. That's the way I memorized that one. I love that passage of scripture. Because he lives, you can have that hope. It depends on where you're going to cast your vote. If you're ready to cast your vote with Jesus, we encourage you to come today. As we stand, as we sing our invitation hymn, because he lives. You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at New Market Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.